Hey everyone, and welcome to our November live event for National Quilter Circle. We once again have Susan Guzman back to answer all of your quilting questions. So Susan, thanks so much for being here. You bet, it's so great to be here again. Perfect. So this, if this is your first live event and you're just tuning in, what we're gonna do is answer your quilting questions live for about the next hour. So if you have any questions, go ahead and type those into the chat screen or the comment box that's below or next to your video, however your screen is set up, and we'll work our way through answering all those questions. So our first one here is kind of a long one, but this one came in from Anne, and she says that she loves fabric and she has a heavenly stash. She has a new Janome that does dishes, it sweeps the floor, it just does everything. It's a wonderful, wonderful machine. She has quilting magazines, too many quilting books, threads, and all of the miscellaneous tools for cutting and feet for the machine. The only thing that's missing is her passion for quilting. I've never taken a course and feel totally intimidated over the thought of quilting. Last year, I did make four placemats and found it to be a chore. I haven't quilted in a year. Is there any hope for me? <laughs> well, um, you really do have to uh, like it um, or enjoy sewing and I would say basically um, my mother-in-law had never sewed before and my husband years and years ago gave her um, this gift certificate to use so that she could go to this quilt camp and um, so what I would recommend is enroll in some sort of uh, quilting retreat or um, join, if you haven't joined um, a quilt guild, that's always a great place to start. Um, if you have any friends that do sew, and maybe they're not quilters, um, perhaps you could convince them to maybe come over and have a sewing party at your house. That's always fun to do. Um, so that's what I would recommend. Um, it sounds like I uh, would like to like quilting. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. I, think mm -hmm. I think it's really just a camaraderie thing, you know, maybe just to get her going and get her excited about it. The other thing I would recommend is how about join uh, the National Quilter Circle uh, current mystery quilt challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another fun thing because it's a very active group and uh, it's just lots of fun. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you for saying that. <laughs> if, if anyone is watching and they aren't participating in the challenge and they want to, um, we're in about week four of a mystery challenge. So since it's a mystery, you don't actually get to see what the quilt looks like, but each week we're releasing new sets of information that that is a block or borders or something about the quilt. Uh, but like you mentioned, there is a Facebook group page that goes along with this, and that's kind of where the whole social side of it is. And there's been a lot of people who have joined uh, the group and I've just been saying, you know, I'm just going to sit back. I'm just going to watch. I just like to see, you know, the pictures that people are posting of all the blocks. But then once they see it, you know, a few weeks, then then they really get into it. So definitely sort of the social side or finding a quilting friend, like you mentioned, is definitely a good way. It's like it's like finding a gym buddy. You have to have someone that keeps you accountable. That's so true. And, you know, there were so many. I know when I did the Lexington sampler, um, I, I met so many new quilters um, who joined and they would uh, send me messages saying, I've never quilted before. This was so much fun. I so enjoyed it. I loved the group and they got to meet new people and new friends. Yeah, absolutely. And there are a lot of people in there too that post you know, where they're from and they're specifically looking for people in their area too. So you could, you know, reach out through the group and find people in your area to then work on the same project, like in the same room. And that'll really, you know, get you going too. And if they have any, um, you know, more experience in quilting, they can help you out along the way as well. Sure, and local quilt shops. You yeah. can't forget them because there's a lot of classes that you can take. And uh, sometimes your local quilt shop can have just one day a week where everybody gets together. So that's really nice and fun too. Yeah, absolutely. All right, our next question here. This is something that you and I were talking about previously right before we went live, um, but whether or not you should trim the selvage off your fabric before you cut the pieces. So specifically to a picture again, on the Facebook group page, you were just talking about somebody didn't trim their selvage off, kind of forgot it was there, and then when they actually made their block, it was still sort of in their, in their block and they had to start over. So should you just always trim that off or is there a rule of thumb as to what to do with that? Well, um, I, I think it really, I've never really heard anybody like be real strong one way or the other about it, um, but I know myself, I always trim it off ahead of time. Um, and when I do that, I don't, I, I have both of the selvage edges together, you know, after I've pressed it. And what I do is I typically um, trim off 
an inch and a quarter. And so that's for both salvages. Um, and that allows you to, if you wish, um, use those salvage edges for uh, any type of projects where you want to kind of show those off because there's a lot of projects out there that you can make um, showing off your salvage edges and it's just kind of a cool look. Um, but I would say I, I wouldn't recommend to trim off any more than that because then you start getting into, if you're using that for a project, that yardage, um, you just want to make sure you have enough for all of the strips that you'll ever need to uh, cut from that. So then if you're reading a pattern and it's telling you to cut a three and a half inch strip by with the fabric, does that take into account that selvage extra or what is that normally based off of? Well, when, when you're, um, when a pattern is written, um, any, well, it, it, it can vary. Um, a good written pattern, usually the, the designer bases that width off of 40 inches, but some Quilters, um, or I'm sorry, some designers who write patterns can also use the figure of 42 inches because they want to um, be able to use as much of that width as possible. So it really kind of depends. But I found that even with um, 42 inch um, uh, uh, written pattern or a, a pattern that's written off of 42 inch width fabric, um, that you can still trim off that one and a quarter inch um it would be off of each end of your width of your fabric those salvage edges um that you should have enough perfect um just back to the salvage edges because i'm looking at I'm, I'm picturing in my head those projects that you mentioned that use salvage edges um and those are def typically the ones that are more decorative right that actually yeah. have the information on them yes right. okay so do you ever cut those off and save them so you remember what your fabric is in case you run out or you need more um, I, I don't, um, I guess because, but I, you know, I work a little differently um, because uh, all the quilts that I make are for their samples for whatever patterns I make for myself, for my own label, Sue's Goose Designs, or for other companies such as Free Spirit. I haven't been doing work for them in a while, but when I used to work for them, for instance, um, you know, they give me exactly what I need which I always sort of up it a little bit. So I have it extra um, for mistakes, but essentially I, I have what I have. But what I would recommend if anybody would uh, trim off their salvage edges and they're wondering, that's an excellent idea, is to maybe um, uh, safety pin that to whatever is left over if they're not using those salvage edges right away. Yeah, that's, that's one thing that, again, to reference our, our Facebook group page for our challenge with us, something that a couple of people have done where they've, you know, just have, they're, they were a little bit short on fabric and they're just posting just a picture and kind of going, help, does anybody recognize this? Um, so to avoid that, you keep your salvages and then you'll know. Once you're done with the project, I guess you can get rid of them, but until you know you have all the fabric you need. Yeah, and I've also, um, I've also suggested to people that um, just to keep a diary of their fabrics, you know, just cut a little swatch off and you can just either jot down or use a salvage edge and staple it onto a piece of paper, just keep sort of a log or a library of what you have. That is another good, um, made me think of another question. Do you ever use the same fabric more than once? Like I know me personally, I don't like multiple projects to look the same. So I want everything to be made out of different fabrics. So if I have anything scrap left, I'm probably, it's gonna be decoration on a shelf. Like I don't know that I'll use it, but do you tend to make things only from different fabrics or re will you reuse something? Um, there are times where I reuse, um, but it would be like scraps from, uh, again, one of those projects that I specifically designed for a sample. Um, like for instance, I'm, I'm using some scraps to make, um, one of those, um, toothbrush rugs. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those. No, um, I have no idea what that is. It's, it's actually, it's sort of like a weaving, um, I'm doing it in, in the round, but, um, it's, you use, and it's either a toothbrush or there's actually, um, a, I, I use this metal um, tool, I guess you could call it, um, that I picked up at my local quilt shop. And um, it's this tool that helps you weave um, either in a, in a square, in a rectangle, or in a circle. Um, but look it up, look up toothbrush rugs on the internet. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, sharing that with you and the audience. 
And you can see what they are if you've never seen one before. But it's just, an, it's a fun project. And it's just strips of fabric that you use and you're just going um, in the round or like I said, in the round or rectangle, whichever shape you wish. And uh, you're just using up all your scraps. I have never heard of it and I just made a note to look it up. And I feel like every time we do one of these live chats, something <laughs> unconventional comes up that I have to like write down and look up. And so I'm going to bring up the one from last month just in case anybody um, is watching and was wondering why we kept talking about horse shampoo last time. So okay. what was the reference to our, our odd topic last month? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, last month uh, we had a question regarding um, washing quilts. And um, uh, specifically, we're, we were kind of talking about vintage quilts or quilts that you want to just keep really pristine. And you want to use a mild quilt soap or a soap, I'm sorry, you want to use a mild soap to wash your quilt with. And um, uh, I had forgotten the name of it, but the name of it is Orvis. Someone actually brought it up in our last chat, and I just couldn't remember for sure, but it is called Orvis, and it's actually used, you can buy it at the farm store um, for washing horses. It's it's just a very mild soap, and, and it's very reasonably priced, and someone found out about it and started using it. And uh, so that's what's used to wash quilts with. And you, what basically what you do is put your quilt in a bathtub, fill it with cold water, use the Orvis soap, and then you wanna just rinse and rinse and rinse until you have all the soap sets out of your quilt. I wanna be able to look up and see who did that for the first time, because I think it would be amazing if that person didn't own a horse because then I'd want to know why they had the shampoo but that is a rabbit hole I will go down later and figure out <laughs> yeah. who's the first person to use this right, right. <laughs> right, our next question here someone asked I have just inherited a load of fabric however it's from a smoker should I wash it all first or just freeze it and wait until I'm ready to use it you know what I would wash it I mean personally I would wash it and um, one tip that I would share with you is um, go ahead and wash it uh, um, as you normally would and add in um, and you try, I mean, if you're able to use a more mild soap with, and what I mean by that is no scents in the soap itself um, and no, um, you know how some of the um, soaps today have like that brightening and all of that, just a basic soap or borax, even a, a get a box of borax and wash those um uh, with those fabrics with the borax, but pour in a quarter cup of white vinegar and that should take out that smell. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely, like you said, wash it first. That way, I mean, even if you Febreze it, I feel like you might not be able to smell it, but if, if you, you say, put it, fold it up and put it on your shelf with other fabric, then you may end up having to wash more fabric than you want when you go to use it. Yeah, and just remember that smokers, um, I mean, the smoke from smokers um, has sort of a residue. So that vinegar will also help remove that and sort of brighten the fabrics up. Perfect. All right, our next one here, um, Deborah says that she has a lot of quilts that are already pieced and she is wanting some opinions on best long arm machines or how you go about contacting somebody about long arms or maybe even getting a long arm frame or a long arm machine. Well, I would say locally um, uh, you can do um, I always go Google search because I don't think anybody uses yellow pages or white pages anymore. Not sure, like, what you <laughs> Maybe think. some in our audience don't even know what those are. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, I would just Google uh, because there are local quilt shops that sell long arm machines and I would do your research. And I always, whenever, like before I bought my um, uh, like workhorse sewing machine, what I did was I just did a lot of research and um, I looked ratings. Um, I read a lot about the um, critiques, the pros and cons that people would post. There's so much info that you can get out on the internet and that's what I would recommend. And then also call your local quilt shop because they may be able to uh, recommend somebody to or a particular brand to you as well. Absolutely. And if you ever have the opportunity to go to a local quilt show or a local quilt market or anything like that, because uh, I just came back from one, which I found if I if I would have gone with 
a much bigger suitcase and like an unlimited budget. I, there was a, there's a lot of things I would have gotten, but a couple of things that speaking of long arms and long arm frames is Grace Company makes a frame that you can actually put your machine on. So you don't have to necessarily buy the long arm machine yet. You can buy just the frame and then sort of play around with it using your own machine first and then see if that's something that you want to get into. And I feel like you'll find you'll, you'll either really like long arm quilting and you want to actually upgrade and get your own long arm or you're going to decide you don't like it and you're going to find a long armor to then does it for you. You know, and I was just thinking, Ashley, we talked about this last time as well. There's all these shops that are popping up now and even within local quilt shops where you can rent time on a machine. So you can also test out machines that way. And I do know that the local shows that come to your area um, there's typically long arm uh, machines at those as well. I would also recommend that you kind of take your time and really, really do your thorough research mm -hmm. because, um, you know, you want to just make sure that you get the one that works well for you and what your needs are. Absolutely. They definitely have them there at shows because I think I've tried out every single one, wrote my name a few times. I Good. played them. <laughs> All right. and, yeah. Our next question here, this is from Becca, and she says, sometimes I see a great geometric design that I would love to turn into a quilt. What is the best way to put it on paper and then plan it out? Or is there a good software that works well? Well, um, as far as paper is concerned, I use just a graph pad that has um, uh, four squares across per inch, um, and that's typically what I use to sketch things out. Um, uh, as far as software is concerned, the only one I've ever used, and I actually do represent them, is um, Electric Quilt. Um, they're at Electric Quilt 8, meaning they, they this is the eighth um, rendition or software update uh, that has occurred uh, for Electric Quilt. And I swear by them. They're just a really, really awesome product. I believe there are some other softwares out there, but I don't really hear a lot about, I, I really, do not hear about them. So I don't know what else is out there, but I love electric quilt. So when you're, because I, I have I have an electric quilt program as well. And so when you are doing it on there, it's easier to say size out your blocks, depending on how, how big you want it to finish. Wait, say that again. When you're using a, a quilt design software, it can be easier to sort of size up or down your blocks and really design a whole quilt. How do you do that? more easily on paper i guess i'm trying to figure out how to word this so like if you're doing on eq8 and you decide that you want a six inch block but then you're like no i'd rather have an eight inch block it's very easy to just you know click and change from six to eight is there an easy way to make adjustments like that in terms of graph paper or planning it out on paper before you make the investment to buy a software well i mean you can certainly like redraw it um, I know that's a lot of work, but you can definitely redraw it or just um, write notes on the side. The thing is, when you get into designing, you have to be really careful because it's not as simple as just resizing. Um, I would say if you start out with, say, a six inch block um, that has a lot of parts and pieces to it, um, because that's an even number, if you're going to upsize that, I would upsize it to an even number. Um, that's going to give you much better results. That doesn't always work. It's not always a science that way either because um, it really comes down to what that block consists of. Um, and uh, those are just like little idiosyncrasies that can come in when you're designing. Yeah, and just, just I bring it to, to further drive home that point. Um, this was a block I was working on earlier. Um, and in, in the design software, I believe it's a nine inch block and I decided to take it down or maybe it was an eight inch and I decided to take it down to a six inch thinking, oh, that's no big deal. It's just half square triangles. Well, turns out now these half square triangles are at some weird 11 and a half sixteenth of a measurement. Um, and I'm ending up having to use templates to cut them instead of, um, being able to cut them at a standard size. So yeah, that definitely think ahead where you'll end up with me. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot more into designing that I think a lot of people realize. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. All right, someone asked, what's the smallest size scrap that you will keep? And do you pre-cut the scraps into a certain size? Um, well, to answer the second part, I don't um, pre-cut into certain sizes. Um, I just, I actually, 
probably not the best way to do it, but I just either keep bags of scraps and then I'll later uh, separate those into colors. Um, I do have bins that I separate into colors, but as far as size, I don't know. I have some as small as, I mean, I have tiny, tiny ones, even tiny strips. I, I'm really bad. I'm kind of fanatical about everything that I keep because I love doing um, improvisational piecing when mm -hmm. I have time. I just enjoy doing it. See, and I didn't used to keep anything smaller than, I mean, I, I would throw away even fairly big pieces because I didn't do a whole lot of like, scrappy things. Um, but now my 19 month old likes to play with fabric. So I keep everything and he just sits there and puts it in boxes and stuff. So if you know anyone with little kids, it's definitely something that they could use to play with. But then we do have a couple of videos on National Culture Circle that um, are sort of ideas on what to do with lots of scraps if you have them but maybe you don't foresee you using them. Um, one is an article where our instructor mentioned she makes uh, dog beds or dog pillows, and then she actually stuffs those with the scraps of fabric and oh, donates them to local shelters and things like that. So that's a that's a way to use them um, and, and then be able to donate them, sort of get rid of them. And then another fun one is an instructor, Heather Thomas, does this video. She calls it nibbles. I'm not sure if that's the technical term, but where you'd actually just take and you cut up all your pieces into, I mean, teeny tiny, like con fabric confetti, and then you lay it on top of another piece of fabric and then just stitch all over it. And it's this really cool sort of texture to it. Wow. Um, and I mean, that is the tiniest, tiniest scrap I've ever seen anybody stitch wow. ever. Wow. Couple <laughs> ideas in case you've got some laying around. Yeah. Perfect. All right, another question. We were kind of talking about this a little bit too before we went live, but. What is your preferred needle and preferred needle size to use when quilting? Well, I actually, um, uh, I ended up printing off a needle guide, Schmitz, um, Schmetz, I should say, uh, S-C-H-M-E-T-Z, has a guide. You can um, actually, um, it's a PDF. Uh, just do um, a quick search or go to their website. And um, it's a two-pager. And it's very detailed on what needles uh, to use. There's actually um, uh, a quilting needle as well as, um, I believe what I use is just an, is it an all-purpose? Uh, let's see. I'm so sorry. I, I know that there's, um, on, on the packaging of any needles, let's say you go into Joann's, um, on the pa packaging, it'll tell you, like for 100% cotton, and that's the needle that you want to get. And um, there's uh, universal needles also that you can get. And there's a variety of sizes. Um, there's actually two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different sizes um, that I would just refer you to go there. But universal is uh, really great. Um, it has like a slightly rounded point, so it goes through the fabrics really nicely. Um, and then. Uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is you would want to change your needle for quilting, meaning quilting the three layers together, your your um, quilt top, your batting, and your backing. When you go to quilt those together, uh, you want to use another needle. Now, there's only two sizes there, 7511 and a 9014. Um, so uh, that's what I, I just go by what they recommend. And um, again, it's pretty much on the packaging wherever you go. Absolutely. And I do think if you um, maybe don't know what, what needle is even in your machine right now, maybe generally if you just buy your machine, it usually comes with uh, either a set of three or at least a couple all-purpose uh, medium weight needles. And those will work for pretty much anything that you have to sew. But there are some sort of telltale signs that you're using the wrong needle. So if you like start stitching and you know, your fabric is just getting pushed down in the throat plate as opposed to your needle actually going through the fabric, either your needle is way too big for the fabric or it's just super dull. Um, so there are lots of things like that that you can sort of look at, okay, I have a problem. Maybe I need to change my needle to fix it. Yeah, and you know what, right on this uh, PDF, it says change your needle, damaged or worn needles. Uh, um, if obviously it's you're um, shredding the threads that you're using, uh, there's skipped or uneven stitches, uh, puckering or, um, uh, fabrics that are damaged. I don't know what that means. Um, damaged fabrics. Uh, let's see. A popping sound made 
by the sewing machine, which I've had that happen to me before too. And I have, I, I didn't even realize that was one of the criteria, but I've changed my needle then and it's been fine. Yes, there's a lot of things like even like you mentioned the thread jumbles or thread nests maybe on the underside of your fabric that I think that just because they're on the underside of the fabric people think that it's a bobbin issue but I like 90% of your issues come from your needle. That's yeah, very true. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Now another question here. We've, we've mentioned before and you've mentioned before that you're not always into gadgets, quilting gadgets. Um, however, in terms of things like rulers, rotary cutters, uh, cutting mats, what do you recommend that somebody just starting out in quilting absolutely get or maybe doesn't necessarily need yet? Well, what I recommend, and I just think that this is good across the board, no matter what project you may be starting with. And uh, of course, you know, sizes are going to vary. Um, but I found um, the best basic tools are a cutting mat that's 36 by 20, 24 by 36, I should say. Um, uh, and then uh, the ruler that I use to cut with is six inches by 24 inches. And then the uh, rotary cutter I use is a 45 millimeter. Um, those are just my basic tools that I always, always use. And then in addition to that, that's where you want to get um, certain size squares. Like I would get an oversized um, square, say like a 12 and a half by 12 and a half. That way you can use it for a variety of sizes when you go to square your blocks up. Um, uh, so that's another suggestion is just to get sort of an, an oversized uh, square ruler. Um, and that's basically, you know, really all you need to start. And of course, you know, just basically scissors. And um, I like to use as far as needles are concerned, or pins, I'm sorry, pins. Um, as far as pins are concerned, I like to use a thinner pin when I'm just regular piecing. But when I start adding like um, blocks together and then borders to blocks, I, I like to use a little bit of a thicker pin, just a basic pin that you find at the, at the store. And you can, um, you know, at your local quote shop or at um, Joanne Fabrics, uh, they can kind of show you the difference. Yeah, I was trying to find as you're as you're naming off all the things that you're using, I can see like 90% of those things, like within my field of vision, but just out of my reach on my table. Like, except for the pins, they're sitting here because I was doing some sewing earlier. But you mentioned two different sizes of pins, and so you can kind of see the difference here, like the super, super thin size and then this much bigger one. Um, and I use both of these pretty much just like you mentioned too in, in sewing. So it's always good to have a mix of all sorts of fun things. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, next question here, someone asked, I'm just starting out and I am a retiree with small finances and I have a basic baby lock uh, sewing machine. How do I proceed in terms of making easy quilts? Um, well, any easy quilts, um, I, I would recommend that uh, you can buy pre-cut fabrics, um, which is really nice. I know that the, um, the Charm Square packs that you can buy at the local quilt shop are really reasonably priced and then you get a variety of color um, so you can uh, make really quick quilts that way um, there's tons and tons of free patterns on the internet um, and then in addition to that I know it's really pretty reasonable isn't it um, uh, joining National Quilter Circle and there's so many different patterns that you can access uh, online through uh, NQC yeah, well, we have we have a lot of stuff that's good for free, uh, a lot of free patterns, free content, um, videos and articles. And then you can upgrade and get certain memberships, which unlock um, deeper content if you want to do that as well. But definitely lots of lots of free content as well. Plus, you could join our mystery challenge and that's a free pattern, too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. In terms of finding some uh, less expensive fabric, have you ever bought fabric like online through like a online swap kind of thing or like an online garage sale kind of somewhere um, different than a craft store or a fabric store yeah I, I guess you could do it i mean i've i've bought fabrics um from garage sales so online garage sales work just as well you know when you're physically there you can kind of see what the quality is and that sort of thing um and then there's also discounted uh areas at your local quilt shop at joanne fabrics joanne fabrics has a lot of great sales um, I know lots of the ladies uh, on National Quilter Circle Facebook page 
they 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 always are talking about the discounted um, coupons that are available like right then through Joann's, which is really great because they it's a real great support system. And uh, so ladies will go out and, and buy what they need for a project or upcoming project uh, at really deep discount prices, which is really nice. So that's a really great way to save. Yeah, absolutely. And it's definitely a great way. I know a lot of people, some people you know, knock fabric depending on where they purchase it from, whether it's a big box store or a chain store versus a small time quilt store. But especially if you're just starting out or maybe, you know, you've been doing it for a while, but you're trying out a new technique or practicing your long arm quilting or something like there's always a way to find um, less expensive fabric to sort of practice on or, you know, build up to before you spend a bunch of money on your prized quilt that you're going to make. Yeah. And don't be afraid to, to use your fabrics. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I don't know. I just, I'm okay with mistakes in quilts. I'm, I'm totally okay with that. I have some that when I first started that I have mistakes, you know, like my points aren't, are, are maybe sewn off or whatever, but I still love them. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're a part of you that you're pouring into uh, this creation. So just go for it. <laughs> you're probably the only one that knows where those points are anyway. What's that? You're probably the only one that knows where those points are anyway. Nobody else is looking at it. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> All right, the next question here, someone asked, I'm not a real quilter, but I'm trying to make my first rag quilt for one daughter. And it's all flannel, and then I should probably make one for my other daughter as well. My question is, can I mix flannel and cotton together, as I cannot find all flannel in the prints that I want? Well, I mean, you can certainly do that, but I would definitely pre-wash in that case, uh, because your flannels and your regular 100% cotton are going to shrink at different rates. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that's what I would recommend. But I think it would turn out to be a really cool, interesting looking quilt. Yeah. In terms of um, stitching, sometimes when people are stitching with something thicker like flannel, they use maybe three eighths inch seam allowance or just something different. Are there any other things you need to do if you are using flannel for one and or mixing the fabrics? I don't treat flannel any differently than 100% cotton. I don't change my um, seam allowances or anything. Um, so, yeah, I, I really don't do anything different. Perfect. I'm going to go back to the rag quilt in just a sec, but I have to say, if you want more information on pre-washing flannel or pre-washing other fabrics, we do have a couple of videos on National Quilter Circle that even give some tips for when you are pre-washing things like flannel, since flannel can tend to ravel a bit more than other fabrics, um, things like running stay stitching around the edge to lessen the amount of lint you're going to get in your washing machine and things like that. Um, but to go back to the rag quilt, if somebody is not familiar with what that is, what is a rag quilt? Um, a rag quilt is um, like a certain way of piecing all, all your different squares together. It's a, a quilt that typically is made with all squares. And just inside, I can't remember if it's like a half inch. I think it's like a half inch inside. Um, you actually make a sandwich. Um, you're, you're essentially quilting as you go. So you have one uh, square, let's say um, four inches uh, of flannel. Then you have, I think like a um, three and a half inch, must be three and a half inch uh, square of batting. And then another four inch um, square uh, for the back. And um, you end up stitching around uh, a half inch, from the edge all the way around um, to secure that. You end up sewing all those pieces together um, in a certain way. And then you're gonna clip um, those half inch extra, you know, mm -hmm. outside of that sewing is what you're gonna be clipping. You throw it in the wash and it becomes very fuzzy. So, so the seam allowance is essentially on the right side rather than being hidden, right? Uh, right, yeah. Okay. Perfect. So that's what makes the, the rag part. Yes. Right. Awesome. Perfect. Per I think I made something similar for my son. I don't know if it turned out. So I think it's on a shelf somewhere. Unfinished. Yeah. One of those projects. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Our next question here, this is one that we had on our Facebook group page, but they want to know if it is something you should do where you clip your corners before you actually put pieces together. So I have a little example. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. What? Yeah, um, whether you should clip your corners before you put your pieces together. So in terms of if you're sewing together two triangles, uh -huh. if you should clip off those little dog ears before you actually sew them together. Is that a good tip, bad tip? Should you do that? Um, you can. I know that um, 
when when you're putting a quilt together that has templates, uh, typically templates come like that with those clipped edges. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, I, I think it's just a way of sort of alleviating some of the bulk at the end, you know, that you get at the uh, tips at the those points. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Also in terms of trimming, uh, because I, this was a tip that I got when I sent my first ever quilt to a long arm quilter, but what is it you're supposed to do sort of to the back of your quilt before you send it off to be quilted, sort of to tidy it up? What should you do? Oh, um, just all of the, you know, the manufacturers, the different manufacturers, so the different fabrics that you get come from different manufacturers. And so the quality is all different. Um, there are certain fabrics that fray a lot. So all of the fraying that are that is on the back of your quilt top before you send it off to be quilted, if someone else is quilting it for you or you're doing it, you want to trim all those um, flyaway pieces uh, from the edges. You want to trim those all up because in some instances you can see maybe a dark thread through a white um, patch after the quilt is done. I might have learned that the hard way. <laughs> and if that's the case, is there any way to fix it? Is there any way to get in there between the layers and kind of hide that or move it? Yeah, not really. Not without damaging your quilt. <laughs> well, all right. I guess it'll just stay like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Nobody else sees it. I mean, it's, seriously. You will see it. Nobody else will. <laughs> all right. All right. Our next question here, and it kind of goes along with maybe the, the quilt that's sitting behind you, but tips for sewing curved seams, specifically like a trunkard's path. Oh, okay. Um, well, I like to use a specialty foot, and wouldn't you know, I didn't write that down tonight. I was, I've been trying to keep a list of all of the uh, sort of um, uh, unique Obscure items we talked about. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's, I, I think it's called, wait, um, Cur Curve Master. I think that's the name of the foot. Um, it's, a, it's a brand name. Um, I happened to meet the woman who invented the Curve Master years ago, and she gave me one to try. And I'm telling you, I, I just love using that. I, you have to just take it really slow. But in her instructions, she shows you how to pin everything together. Or you don't really even pin it together. Just the pieces as they go underneath your presser foot just come together beautifully. And there's a couple of extra tools that come along with that little package. It's not very expensive either. Um, but look up the Curve Master. Other than that, I, that's the only thing I use for curve uh, piecing. I don't so since, since I've never seen this foot before, can you just sort of describe what makes what makes it work? I mean, what makes it so special? Well, there's like um, there's there's a, a piece. Of, it's a plastic foot, and there's a piece of plastic that the fabrics um, butt up against. And then as as it's going through, as you're sewing, it's sort of pulling pulling through um, uh, the the uh, two pieces that are you're sewing together and you're using a tweezers I think that's I think that's the only two I haven't done it in a while but there's this piece this tweezers and then um, that you clip onto uh, one of the fabrics as it's going underneath and it just it just works I it's kind of miraculous <laughs> all right well I'm gonna have to look it up and then probably try it and we'll, we'll see yeah. how yeah definitely okay. Well, so I guess it does in terms of sewing. So I, I come from more of a, a garment sewing background. That's how I first learned to sew. And whenever you have a curved seam, you always, you know, clip your curves or you, you notch it out so it presses flat. Do you have to do something similar to that when you are quilting? You know what? When you when you do that, when you do like a drunkard's path, there's sort of a natural way that the fabric is kind of leaning. And that's typically where I press it. So I, I don't really, I kind of throw that rule out of pressing towards the dark when it comes to curves. Uh, because nine times out of 10, you're not gonna have any issues with any see-through or anything if you have like a lighter fabric. Because think of this, when you just, this is like with any, um, any type of pressing, if you're pressing towards the light, um, when you press towards the light, underneath, or what will show through is the white. It's not going to be the dark because the dark is underneath. Does that make sense? 
because mm -hmm. the seam itself, um, let's say you're you're sewing along here. This is your seam allowance. You're sewing along here. This is the light. The dark is on the back side. When you press, so you have that open. When you press towards the light, that white is the seam allowance is directly under that white piece of fabric. So you won't see the dark. Right. All right. Here, here's your here's your little. This <laughs> I have a little straps in front of me. Yeah. So you're like you're saying, here's the dark, here's the light. So when you press, if you if you had to press this, okay. yeah. yeah. So See, I guess when people do that, um, not necessarily worried about the the fabric color showing through. Are they trying to eliminate the shadows that you would see? Is there sort of a you say you're going to be you know submitting a quilt for judging? Is is that something that could could knock you? Is if there's little shadows that you can see? I, I don't know necessarily if. Just the, the rule of thumb is to press towards the dark. That's the rule of thumb, but there are exceptions. And judges know that there are exceptions. Um, so if you've really thought through the way that you're pressing, you're piecing and pressing, um, uh, you should be fine as far as um, a quilt being judged. Perfect. All right. We talked earlier a little bit about the types of needles you use when you are piecing and when you're quilting, but what kind of thread do you use when you're piecing and quilting? Um, and is it necessary to use different weights when you are doing a different task? Well, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Well, I, I feel that there are, but there's really no rule of, well, I should say there's like a rule of thumb, but really anything goes today. Um, there's so many creative people and, um, everybody does something different and there's I, like the quilt police aren't going to get after you. <laughs> Maybe. Basically, basically I'll, I'll share what I do. Um, so I use RFL thread. I do represent them. I think it's a fantastic product. Um, I've never had any problems with it breaking. Um, uh, what I use is 50 weight. So it's a thin weight. The higher the number, the thinner the thread. So I use a 50 weight for piecing and um, I use a 40 weight. So it's a little bit thicker when I go to uh, quilt. So the three layers together. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't use 50 weight. You can. I like the look of a little bit of a thicker thread personally uh, on, the, on the top. So um, that's why I use 40 weight. And I think most uh, quilters do use 40 weight. But again, there's really there's really no, uh, I don't know, rule about it. <laughs> just, just to clarify real quick. So the numbers, the higher the number, the thinner the thread, correct? Yes. Okay. Right. Making sure. For, for instance, um, one other thing, uh, RFL also sells an 80 weight. And the 80 weight we use for applique and also English paper piecing. Um, so those threads just sink right into the fabric and you really don't see them. And that's why you, I like to use, personally, I like to use 50 weight for piecing because, you know, it's not as thick as 40 weight and they, the stitches pretty much disappear. I have never used 80 weight and I just did, like, like I have a whole stack of blocks there that I just appliqued that I probably wish I would have known that that existed. <laughs> <laughs> I could have used it. It's fairly um, new. They did, it's, it's a fairly new uh, thread weight. I'm gonna to have to look it up. Um, we also talked a little bit before, you like to match your thread colors to your fabric when even when piecing, not necessarily when uh, quilting, right? Which is something I've never done. So I guess why is it that you do that? Um, well, I I don't I don't necessarily I I don't necessarily match it. I mean I I, I want it to blend in. I like to use a neutral when I piece. Um, if my fabrics sort of uh, turn to sort of a gray hue, the light fabrics, let's say it's an off, like a dove gray um, uh, base, that's the color that I usually use. Or maybe I use a little bit warmer of a color. But let's say, for instance, um, a good example would be um, uh, Civil War uh, reproduction fabrics usually have sort of a goldish hue to them. So that's the thread typically that I use um, to piece with. So. I usually end up just grabbing if I have just a little bit left of this and a little bit of, I use piecing as my way to use up the little bit of thread that I have left. Nothing matches it just kind of all <laughs> together. 
Uh, back to one of your previous comments, because we had we put a little poll up on the Facebook group page earlier asking people if they wanted to try paper piecing. And a lot of people were asking if we meant by machine or by hand. And you mentioned English paper piecing. So can you kind of tell us the difference between paper piecing and English paper, paper piecing? Yeah, English paper piecing is, um, let's say, for instance, you wanted to make a quilt using hexagons. Um, English paper piecing takes a hexagon shape, and what you essentially do is wrap a piece of fabric around that with a quarter, extra quarter inch seam. You sort of um, base that fabric onto um, that base paper uh, hexagon, and you end up joining those together by hand. Um, the, there are different techniques that are coming out. Uh, just, I would say over the past probably 10 years, um, people are doing them a little bit differently instead of basting it on. See, I've always based, hand basted it with thread and needle through the paper um, just to get that shape on there. But people are also using glue, um, fabric glue to glue it to the, uh, the back of the piece of paper. And, they do, and it, it is quicker, I mean, when you think about it, instead of using needle and thread. So um, that's another way to do it. Then as opposed to um, foundation paper piecing is what you're talking about. Um, uh, foundation paper piecing is essentially what you get is um, uh, an outline of what the block is or a section of the block. And really that's probably more proper is a section of the block. And um, you're essentially uh, piecing using that as um, your base template. It's more involved than that. It's something I can't explain without having props in front of me right now. But I know that um, National Culture Circle has a lot of, um, <laughs> you're, you're shaking your head. Uh, they have a lot of um, uh, videos that you can watch um, uh, to learn how to do that. Absolutely. We, and we have the full range of them as well. I mean, I've done a couple that are that are free videos on the site that you can check out that just gives you sort of the basic overview. This is foundation paper piecing. Here's how you do it. Um, Heather Thomas has done a couple where she, she actually does a slightly different method um, than what I've done. And then I also show a method on how to do paperless paper piecing or using freezer paper so you don't actually have to tear the paper and you can reuse your pattern. Um, and then if you want to get even more in depth into it, we have a, an entire class that um, a previous instructor that worked with us, Laura Roberts, did an entire class on paper piecing. So we have everything you need to know about paper piecing can be found on National Culture Circle. I know, and it's foundation paper piecing is something that you either love or you hate. <laughs> I didn't I, like it, but I, I I enjoy it. I, I, did. I, I just haven't done it in a while, and I haven't designed a pattern using it in a long time. But it, it I really enjoy it. And it's really, I know what the frustrating part is. Um, because what you're doing is you're sewing on the lines of your um, pattern, mm -hmm. but you're adding the fabrics to the back of that paper. And it can be very confusing, and I totally get it. But once you get it down pat, it's it really is easy. Yeah, you kind of sort of get into a rhythm of it and you just kind of keep going. I actually just just worked on designing a little Christmas light, Christmas light bulb um, paper piecing pattern that that was I, it's been three projects ago and I haven't finished it yet. And I, things keep coming up, but it's it's on my list to finish. But it is something that once you sort of get the technique down and figure out which one of those methods you like, I think you'll you'll really get into paper piecing. So if you want to try it out, you can join our uh, Mr. Challenge now and our new challenge coming out in hopefully January, we are planning to do a paper piecing. And if not right off the bat, then it'll be the next one. But we have a paper piecing plan coming up soon. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And then just back to your English paper piecing, because you mentioned there was a couple different variations on how to do it. And um, my grandma was visiting recently and she does it to where she doesn't even actually baste it to the paper. So she's still actually stitching it around that hexagon template, but not actually stitching through the paper. So then when she's ready to remove the paper, it just pops right out. So it's not even like stuck to the fabric. So, so many new ways to do it. Yeah. Perfect. All right, next question here, someone asked, I washed some pre-cuts and they shrunk badly. If I don't pre-wash, will my quilt and backing shrink up this way also? Well, first of all, I recommend that you never 
uh, pre-wash, pre-cut fabrics because um, you can get a lot of fraying. So if patterns are asking for a particular size pre-cut, um, you can run into some issues um, there. Uh, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I wish we could have caught you be, beforehand. If you do pre-wash anything um, uh, for your quilt top, I do recommend that you pre-wash your backing. Um, and uh, we, uh, National Quilter Circle had um, a designer who actually pre-washes her batting as well. Personally, I would never do that. I think that it, to, my opinion is that you lose a lot of fibers when you pre-wash batting. Um, I understand the concept behind it, but I personally would never do that. If you, so if you don't, so say you're using 100% cotton batting, cotton batting can also shrink as much as cotton fabric, right? Well, do you, I don't know what the, the degree is, but I, I'm sure it does um, shrink up more mm -hmm. than Do you run the risk of then your fabric not shrinking and your batting shrinking? Is that gonna, I know some people like the rumpled look, you know, or is, is that something that can happen? Well, there's going to be differences all across the board. I mean, I, I just have the best uh, results with not pre-washing fabrics and not pre-washing batting. And you, we've talked about this before, and I know it's on your list, so I'm going to bring it up because we've asked you what kind of batting you use. Um, and so what, what kind of batting do you use? I use Airlight Manufacturing, and I use the 80-20, so it's 80% cotton, 20% polyester. I was always, I've always been a purist. Even buying clothes for myself, always 100% cotton if it was cotton, um, wool, you know, 100% wool. I've just always been that way. And um, so I was kind of, I don't know, maybe it was um, kind of snobby. I don't know. But quite frankly, I was talked into the 80-20 and I love it. I absolutely love it. It also drapes really nicely, especially if you're going to be sending a quilt to a show. It's going to drape a lot nicer um, uh, because the 100% cotton is going to keep those folds a lot longer. Um, and you just have problems over time with that. But uh, the company that I get my batting from is called Airlight Manufacturing. And um, uh, the contact is Eric Herman. And he does deal, he, he deals wholesale, but he also deals directly to consumers as well. And he is in um, Michigan, Michigan, Michigan. And um, his uh, contact information, his phone number, you can reach him at 248-335-8131. Or you can email him, E as in Eric, E dot Herman, H-E-R-M-A-N, at Airlight, A-I-R-L-I-T-E, manufacturing, you want to spell all that out, dot com. And I just talked to him today, as a matter of fact. He and I kind of lost touch for a little, for kind of a while. Um, I've, ha I've had batting for a while. He just sends me batting whenever I need it, and I haven't really needed any. And... Um, He's just a really, really nice guy. Um, he just got married. I don't know mm -hmm. if you would want me uh, sharing that, but I'm Too late. sure. Out there. Yeah, and he was a really great guy. And um, and his um, batting is reasonably priced as well. Perfect. And that's good, because I know we've talked about it several times. Um, like I said, we have, we have that your, your list of things too that we need to, you know, revisit that we've mentioned but not quite had all the information for so that's perfect <laughs> that's something where um so if you are sending a quilt to a long arm quilter like i've done pre many multiple times now is there can you request what kind of batting you want used or do you kind of have to just go with whatever the quilter wants to use um well i think that's a conversation to have ahead of time and if there's a particular batting that you like uh, for instance, I just send my batting along with my quilt top. Um, I've sent my quilt tops out before, and uh, there was one quilter that used a batting that um, supposedly it was 100% cotton, but to me it felt like polyester, and I just didn't like it. I didn't like the way it lofted. So I would say find the batting that you really love. Ask your quilter if they use that batting. If they don't, go ahead and buy I often handle it or hand deliver it uh, along with your quilt top. 
Perfect. All right, next question here. Um, I'll, I might answer this one unless, unless you want to, but it says, how do I sign up for the mystery quilt? I don't see it on this page. <laughs> so sometimes we will have a little banner that is above or below the video. So if it's not on the page that you're looking at, you can just either search mystery challenge on National Quilter Circle's uh, website. You can go to NQC Quilt Block Challenge Facebook group page. Uh, you can join there. We post the same information uh, on the Facebook group page as we do on the actual website on the blog post. So uh, either one of those two places you can find it. And then if you do, they prefer um, email over Facebook. If you're not into Facebook page, you don't want to join the group page. If you find it uh, through searching Mystery Quilt Challenge on just the the National Culture Circle website, then you just put in your email and every Friday, uh, the new block or new set of information or whatever it is for this mystery uh, will just get emailed to you so you don't have to necessarily do Facebook. So I know a lot of people out there don't do that, which boggles my mind, but you know, people aren't always on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Perfect. So um, just a little bit because you've done one of the previous challenges, can you talk a little bit about what your quote was um, and maybe how that's how how a mystery quilt challenge is different and why you shouldn't be afraid of um, the fact that it's a mystery. <laughs> okay, well, the one that I did with this summer, it was a nine week challenge. And uh, what we did was um, we, it was a weekly challenge, uh, just like this one is. And uh, we released two blocks, um, or you made two blocks at a time of the same uh, design. And uh, that was called the Lexington Sampler. I actually am selling the pattern on my website. Um, I'm doing a special uh, right now where anyone uh, can contact me through my contact page of my website, which is suzgoosedesigns.com. And uh, I'm giving that special price uh, as well as free shipping to US residences. Um, but anyway, that was a quilt that we did for nine weeks. And um, uh, we went through all the instructions on how to make the blocks and then piece everything together, um, add the, we did a piece border on that quilt. And um, so that uh, was all the instructions were given. Um, and then that, as opposed to a mystery quilt, well, um, the mystery quilt, you don't get to see what the quilt, the end result is up front, mm -hmm. <laughs> which can be kind of frustrating to some people. And um, the thing is, I think you just kind of have to let it go, um, take a deep breath and jump in and just have fun and just have fun with, with the process of, gosh, I don't even know what this uh, end result is going to look like. And just have fun with the process. And I know that um, I did happen to look at uh, the very first uh, PDF and everything's broken down really nicely. And um, uh, it's just been a really nice process. It's a great learning experience. It's something brand new um, that a lot of people uh, have never done before. And um, I just think it's a really great thing that you guys are doing uh, the mystery quilt right now. <laughs> It's definitely a lot of fun. I have to say, I'm in that group of people that might find it hard to not know what it looks like ahead of time. So I'm really glad that I got to be a pattern tester. So I do know what it looks like. Um, <laughs> so this, this will sort of be our last question here, but just to sort of wrap up for, since you can't see what the quilt is going to look like, obviously the very first thing that we provided was uh, fabric requirements and we have suggested colors. Now, if you don't want to use maybe the colors that we suggested, how do you know if your shade or tone of fabric is going to be similar to maybe the shade that we've suggested? How do you sort of pick your fabric around that? Well, it's really just a visual thing. Um, yeah, just look at it. And if, if anybody has issues with choosing fabrics, I always recommend take all of the info that you know about it and take it to your local quilt shop or take it to a friend who maybe is a quilter um, or an artist, uh, an artist friend of yours. Um, uh, who can help you kind of determine what a tone means, um, uh, what um, uh, uh, maybe scale. I, I don't know if, if this challenge is getting into scale uh, of fabrics or anything like that. But, um, you know, it really makes a difference whether you use a, a big floral um, in a block where you're using just tiny pieces. Um, you know, you're not always going to be able to show all that off really well. So you don't want to use a huge floral in the small pieces. That's really more for either your backing or a, a pretty border or something like that. Yeah, 
Absolutely. But if you don't want to put any thought into it at all, you can always just randomly pick some. There's a lot of people that are just sort of uh, making a scrappy quilt as well. So you can always just sort of do something like that and just sort of see how it turns out in the end. Yeah, that's true. Or just go ahead and choose the exact co colors that are um, being suggested through the challenge and then you'll, you won't have any issues at all. <laughs> Perfect. That's good suggestion as well. Perfect. Well, I want to thank you so much for answering everybody's quilting questions over the last hour. Thank you very much for doing that. I'm sure everyone appreciated it as well. You bet. This is fun as always. I, I always enjoy this. Oh, good. We always enjoy you too. <laughs> Thanks. Of course. And just to recap, if anyone wants to sign up for the challenge, either go to the Facebook group page or uh, search for it on National Quilter Circle website. Uh, and we have all of the information in both those places. And it's a lot of fun. Especially our, from back to our very first question of the night, somebody who is looking for a little inspiration in terms of quilting, you'll definitely find it if you join our challenge. Awesome. Yep.